Good morning once again. The Lord be with you. Thank you so much. This morning, our primary text for our sermon can be found in the book of Job, chapter 23, verses 1 through 9, and verses 16 through 17. Job 23, 1 through 9, and 16 through 17. If you'd like to follow along, you can find this reading on Old Testament page 446 in your pew Bible. Job chapter 23, verses 1 through 9, and 16 through 17. And here's what it says. Then Job answered, Today also my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his dwelling. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with argument. I would learn what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, but he would give heed to me. There an upright person could reason with him, and I should be acquitted forever by my judge. If I go forward, he is not there, or backward, I cannot perceive him. On the left he hides, and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right, but I cannot see him. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. If only I could vanish in darkness, and thick darkness would cover my face. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One thing that I have noticed since living in the South these past, I don't know, 17, 18 years or so, is that you all have sayings that we just don't have in the North. Some of these I have become quite familiar with. Some I've only heard a time or two. And some have meanings that I've yet to figure out. A few of my favorites. Even a blind hog finds an acorn now and then. I've also heard this one quite often. The sun don't shine on the same dog's tail all the time. I always chuckle when someone says something is as scarce as hen's teeth. Or that someone is as happy as a bird with a french fry. But perhaps my all-time favorite comes from my maternal grandmother, who was actually reared in the South who, when observing someone with a particularly grievous affliction, would say the person was poor as Job's turkey. Now, I recall one time wondering aloud exactly how poor Job's turkey was. And her response went something like this. He was so poor that he had to lean up against the fence to gobble. Which I suppose is pretty poor. Now, as we consider the life of Job, the story as we find it in Scripture, we don't read of any turkeys. Now, he's said to have loads of sheep and camels and oxen and donkeys, but not a single turkey in sight. That said, we might imagine that had Job owned a turkey, it likely would have been quite poor. Because Job was a person well acquainted with suffering. Job was a man who, who had everything and then lost everything. He lost his fortune as all of his livestock was raided or slaughtered. He, he lost his family. All of his children were killed. 
He lost his health as, as he was stricken with sores over the entirety of his body. He lost his dignity as he sat in a heap of ashes, scraping himself with a shard of broken pottery. But in today's Old Testament text, Job, Job seems to lose something else, something perhaps most devastating of all. Job loses his integrity. Now, as Job's story opens, if you're familiar with his story, Job refuses to speak ill of God, even though he is suffering tremendously. He refuses to blame God. But not only to blame God, he refuses to question God. Despite his circumstances, Job actually blesses God, doesn't he? And asks, shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? But in this morning's reading, Job is singing a very different tune. Job is defensive. Job is argumentative. He's angry. He says that his complaint is bitter, although bitter is probably better translated as contentious or defiant. In other words, he is ready to duke it out with God. He is ready to have it out over the things that he has had to endure. He is set to give the Almighty an earful concerning the calamities that have befallen him. Would he contend with me? Would God contend with me in the greatness of his power, Job asks? No, but he would listen. I'm going to tell him exactly how it is, Job says. Job is so convinced of his guiltlessness and therefore his suffering being unjust that he becomes indignant toward God, almost arrogant. At his story's outset, he, he wholly, he fully depends on God. As his troubles begin, he still trusts God. As things progress, he starts to question God, but finally here he ends up assuming that he knows better than God. Now, it's, it, it's no secret <laughs> that everyone at some time experiences sufferings of sorts. No human life is, is exempt from trial. It's, it's part of what it means to be human, I think. Each of us here has known some kind of pain. You may be walking through a shadowy valley even now. We readily admit that. And we, we confess it to be so. And yet, for, for some reason, I've never quite figured this out, so many of us seem shocked or bewildered when those moments come. So many of us wonder, if not in words, then surely in our hearts, how could this happen to me? How could this happen to me? And we seek justification for the evils which surround us and desire answers to the question of why bad things happen to, can you complete the sentence, good people. Why? God, why? But look to Job, right? Look to Job. If, if we're to believe the words of Scripture, he was about as good as one gets. At least the way that he is painted in his story. Scripture says he was blameless. He was upright. Two words that, that I wouldn't apply to, to, to just anyone. <laughs> At least ways to myself. 
We're told that, that he feared God and, and, and turned away from evil. Again, things that we don't always live into very well. He rose early and he made burnt offerings for his children, offered prayers to God on their behalf. In short, if ever there was a good man, a decent man, someone that you would want for a friend, for a neighbor, Job was it. And nonetheless, Job suffered. He suffered exceedingly, and more than that, perceived God to be absent in the midst of his tribulation. When Job cries out, it's not unlike the psalmist who wonders in chapter 22 why he has been forsaken by God. In our gospel lesson too, we hear something of this truth that no one escapes hardship. And Jesus is explaining to a rich man what it means to be his follower, which is essentially giving up anything that prevents someone from being fully committed to the way of Christ. In this man's case, it was his extraordinary wealth which many biblical scholars contend that he may have even gained by dishonest means, and so Jesus' command to give it away. But afterwards, St. Peter chimes in saying, Look, we have left everything to follow you. Indeed, many of Jesus' disciples left homes. They left jobs. They left spouses. They left their families in order to be a part of his ministry. And Jesus commends this, saying those who have given up so much for the sake of the gospel will receive it back a hundredfold. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children. But if we're not paying careful attention, we'll miss what Jesus says at the very end of that piece. Because after he lists all of the reward that's coming, Jesus says, those who have given everything will also receive fields with persecutions. Even those who surrender everything, even those who give up everything, all that they are and all that they have for the sake of Christ and His good news will still be met with suffering. See, too many folks are guilty of the sort of thinking that seems to be going on with Job and with his friends that, that bad people always have hard lives. And that good people always have it easy. If we displease God, we, we get heartache and, and despair. But if we please God, we get sunshine and unicorns. But the biggest problem with that line of reasoning is that Jesus says, don't get angry at me. Jesus says there are no good people. Why do you call me good? There is none good. But God, the man comes up and kneels before him, calls him good teacher, a title that was fitting for Jesus. No, of course. But Jesus says, why do you call me good? God is the only one who is good. And the only way that we can claim any sort of goodness in our life is because we are made in God's image and God puts it there. Apparently, Job missed that memo. And too often, we seem to miss it as well. But how else can we understand? How else can, can we make sense of difficult circumstances in life? How else can we come to terms with our misfortunes? It's only reasonable, isn't it? To assume that God punishes the wicked and blesses the good. That's the only way that it seems to work. 
And such cut and dry delineations are easy for us to understand. They, they provide for us a measure of comfort. This is, of course, until we are the good ones. Experiencing the loss of employment or the loss of a loved one or the diagnosis of a terminal disease. And then these designations, these ideas of good and bad and what all of this means, they, they become a bit blurry, don't they? The cause and effect rationale seems to make much less sense when we fancy ourselves the good ones who are carrying the burden. It's critical for us to recognize, however, that such black and white explanations of suffering aren't really representative of a biblical perspective. They are rather much more closely connected to a Western philosophical stance of if-then. Reading the scriptures closely, one finds that its pages truly offer very little in the way of explaining the reason or reasons suffering exists. In the book, God of the Oppressed, James Cone writes, the Bible has little or no interest in rational explanations regarding the origins of evil. That evil exists is taken for granted. It's assumed. The focus of Scripture is on what God has done. What God is doing and on what God will do to defeat the principalities and the powers of evil. And elsewhere, Cohen says, the biblical view that God suffers for us and has defeated the powers of evil decisively in the cross and resurrection of Jesus, it does not mean that evil no longer exists. The war against evil, the war against suffering is still going on. The final victory will take place with the second coming of Christ. And so in the meantime, in the meantime, Christians are called to suffer with God in the fight against evil in the present age. We're called to suffer with God, alongside of God. That's important language, I think, for us to hear because Job kind of missed it. The psalmist missed it. And sometimes we miss it. I miss it. Whatever and whenever we suffer, we don't suffer alone. God is beside us through any and all of life's turmoil. And knowing this, dear friends, is far more important than finding any rational explanation for it. Any reason for it. Any cause for it. Think about it. I mean, really think deeply about it. Would it relieve us at all if we knew why we face the things that we do? I'd say it's doubtful at best. But knowing that God is with us, trusting that God is with us, being convinced that God is with us as we endure difficulties ought to provide a tremendous comfort indeed. More than this, however, God is intimately familiar with our sufferings. In Christ, God relates to all that we know and all that we feel in terms of human pain. The author of Hebrew writes, we do not have a high priest. Hear this. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are. In every respect. This is what scripture says. Jesus knew loss. Jesus knew hunger. Jesus knew poverty. 
Jesus knew abandonment and loneliness, grief and pain. And at the end, at the end of his earthly life, Jesus knew what it was to feel that God was distant. Do we ever feel that? Jesus knew what it was to feel that God is distant, quoting the psalmist just before tasting death himself. I guess the point is this, the key, the key to facing life's sufferings is not necessarily to explain them, but rather to trust that God knows our pain. As in Christ, God suffers as we do. Beloved, we needn't We need to pretend that there are any easy answers to the questions of of Job's suffering. There aren't. Any more than there are easy answers for our own. But we do know that. Inevitably, we will all be met with situations wherein we feel like we've gotten a raw deal. It's like Anna was explaining to our children this morning. We'll feel confused. We'll feel upset, we'll feel angry, we'll ask questions. We'll all be met with trials that appear unfair or even nonsensical. We will all know times wherein we feel like like Job. (laughs) Or perhaps worse, like Job's turkey. Too weak even to gobble. Sometimes these burdens will be greater. Sometimes they'll be lesser. But at all times, I pray that we would be mindful of the presence of the one who is merciful. Our great high priest who provides grace to help in our every time of need. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.